Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Here's a few of our announcements. Uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. to 7.30 is our SWAT and jam session. No meals will be served uh, until school re resumes. And then Thursday, Sunrise Nursing Home and Rehab uh, is holding a uh, 51st anniversary celebration from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. with a live entertainment and, and lunch. And will be ser uh, well, it'll be served as well. Uh, so uh, plan to join that if you, if you may. And then next Sunday uh, through Thursday, July the 25th through the 29th, is our Vacation Bible School. And uh, from 6 p.m. to 8.30, and see Debbie Kershaw if you can help. Um, Pam, would this be a good time for you to say something about the meeting? Sure. Yeah. If you are interested in volunteering to help the vacation Bible School, <coughs> you can use this. Uh, this is our main access this day. Um, we can really use as many volunteers as possible. And it won't have to be like the whole week, but we can do like specific jobs. So it could be like just 15 minutes, half hour, one day. So if that, it all works for you. If you could uh, meet in the hall after church, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Uh, and then next, um, the August the 14th is our Back to Mac event which will be held and if you would like to uh, help supply a third grader uh, with a backpack uh, please see Alicia or Debbie. Yeah, we have a lot of backpacks left over from last year so the easiest is just to donate money because we're going to have a lot of money. How much is needed? Do you know? And then uh, I believe Saturday, August the 21st, the North Mac Moms will be having a rummage sale in Pittman Hall. And uh, that'll be from 9 a.m. Uh, through noon. And now's the time to gather up your items uh, you no longer need and, and want and donate them uh, for the cause. Uh, and they ask that no televisions or appliances unless you are willing to take them back if they do not sell. And then we resume our Zoom Bible study, um, August 23rd. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? No, not on the, on the second page there, there's a little notation about targeting the employees and the basement um, sometime in September. So coming soon, yes, so be prepared, <laughs> just like we are for the Lord's coming, right? Yeah, be prepared. Um, birthdays and anniversaries. Um, happy birthday today to Linda Gerson, and happy birthday on Tuesday to Chris Servalone, and happy birthday on Wednesday, Sharon Crawford. And I won't ask how old you're going to be. <laughs> Our call to worship today comes from Psalms 34, 7 through 8. God's angel sets up a circle of protection while we pray. Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Blessed are you who run to him. Let's stand and sing hymn number 409, Who is on the Lord's side?
be seated. And now comes our time of offering and prayer. And we have the offering plate in the aisle for those who would like to uh, give their offering. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you we can give to you. And we just ask that these monies go to do your will to, to reach those who are in need and uh, uh, hear the, the good word of the gospel and of Jesus Christ uh, as Savior for our sins. Lord, we thank you that we can uh, be available to do that um, and to give of our resources. And Lord, uh, we just ask that uh, we be obedient to you and have that relationship with you as we go through this life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's uh, stand again and sing hymn number 598, All the Way of My Savior Leads Me. seated and at this time as we get ready to dismiss for children's church I just want to mention that uh, Maggie uh, will be teaching it today and uh, as well she's going to camp uh, this week up at Springfield so be in prayer for her and uh, that she has a good time and uh, learns a lot uh, about Jesus and can bring that back for us in Camden Camden as well. Okay. Um, praises and prayer, uh, prayer can prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come and um, know you in this personal way with brothers and sisters and family. But Lord, we do have concerns for um, our relatives and uh, our loved ones that are hurting at this time. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to be with them and to bless them uh, in knowing you as they go through these battles uh, with cancer and, and different problems. Uh, Lord, just lift them up uh, uh, to, uh, and, and make them strong uh, to deal with this. Lord, help them to do not worry, but to put the worry on you. And, uh, and uh, may we be confident in knowing that you will take care of us, as you said in your word. 
Lord, we just uh, ask uh, uh, for mercy for those who are, are going through the COVID right now, who are still having problems with that and with the country. We ask you to be with our leaders, Lord, as they make decisions uh, for this country and uh, even around the world. Uh, uh, we just ask that uh, you lift them up and, and uh, guide them. Lord, we know that you use people that unbeknownst to them for your, for your ways and help us to know that you do have a plan in our life for this world. And um, uh, no matter what we do, uh, you, you make it happen. And we can trust in that through your word. Lord, just guide us throughout this week and direct us. Help us to be obedient to you. And Lord, we do thank you for Jesus who has paid the price for our, our sinful nature and the sins that we, we commit. Uh, help us to look at ourselves and evaluate and to know um, where we are in our relationship with you. And uh, Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, our scripture reading comes from Romans 2, 1, 1 through 2. Romans 12, I'm sorry. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but to, to the transformation by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Some of you have inquired about Della. Uh, she's A W O L here. <coughs> and uh, you don't need to tell her I said so. But anyway, uh, she has a, grand, has a couple of grandsons uh, in Joplin. One of them uh, is married and uh, expecting a baby, and uh, so she was uh, the great grandma that uh, felt it necessary to be at the, at the uh, baby shower yesterday. Uh, I don't understand that, of course, but uh, anyway. Questions about the will of God. That sounds like a huge subject, and it, and it is. And uh, I doubt that uh, we will will answer all of the questions that you and I may have about the will of God we probably won't even get to all of the questions that we have about the will of God. But there is some help, I think, that is available to us. Leslie Weatherhead, that's a, a name you probably have not heard. Um, he was uh, ordained, actually, uh, uh, as a Methodist minister and then later served for a long period of time as a congregational pastor at the City Temple in London. And he was, uh, he was their pastor during the extremely difficult days of World War II. And in that context, he wrote a book simply entitled The Will of God. It's a small book, uh, less than 100 pages, and uh, well worth anybody's reading, I believe, and I recommend it. Um, his book consists of five messages that he gave to the folks at uh, the city temple to try to answer some of the troubling questions that were related to the crisis that they were dealing with, 
their questions I'm sure came to him on a daily basis, particularly during the time when London was being bombed uh, by German uh, uh, German uh, troops and air air uh, air attacks. During that kind of time, uh, he was dealing with their questions, trying to help them make sense out of an absolutely senseless time in their lives. Um, if you choose to read that book, and I think it would be worth your while, you will find some theological differences probably, but in spite of those, I, I think it's uh, to be recommended. I find it helpful. The first four chapters, first four of the five, are God's intentional will, God's circumstantial will, God's ultimate will and uh, discerning the will of God. And I, I will lean on some of his information uh, in this message today. <clears throat> take take a, with me a, a little closer look at, the, at how he describes the meaning of those first three chapters that I mentioned. God's intentional will. He says, what I mean by his omnipotence, and that's God's all-powerful nature, not that everything that happens is his will, but that nothing can happen which finally defeats his will. In the second chapter on circumstantial will, he says, there is an intentional purpose of God for every man's life, but because of human folly and sin, because man's free will creates circumstances of evil that cut across God's plans, it may create circumstances which disturb God's intention for us. There is a will within a will of God, the circumstantial will of God, he calls it. <clears throat> And the ultimate will, he says, is God's ultimate will, the goal which I believe he reaches, not only in spite of all men, of, of all that men may do, but even using man's evil to further his own plan. And he refers to the crucifixion as a prime example of that. <clears throat> Who does not have questions about the will of God? Raise your hand if you don't have any questions about the will of God. That's kind of what I thought would be my response there. We all do. If we claim to be a follower of Jesus, we will want to know something about the will of God. That's part of our nature, part of the DNA of being a child of God. We will want to know something about his will. And we probably have questions. Um, here are uh, a few of the questions that I have chose to deal with a little bit this morning. <clears throat> By no means is it a complete list? Probably you, all of you, each of you would be able to add questions to that list and they would be meaningful questions. But here's what I have to work with. I, I think these questions have, have, in my judgment, plagued every follower of Jesus Christ all the way back to the apostles and the apostle Paul and those who followed him originally. The first question, how can I know the will of God with some real certainty? Second question, 
Should I seek God's will in every little decision in life? What help does God provide so we can discern his will? Do I really want to find God's will? Or maybe to just get approval for what is my will for my life? Once I know God's will, do I have the courage to do it? And the last one, the tragedies that touch everyone's life, how can they be called the will of God? And perhaps you are asking in your mind at the moment, what about the answers? I didn't promise you any answers. I promised you questions. And uh, that's my sneaky way of getting, getting past this point. Uh, anyone who says that they have all of the answers to the questions about the will of God, those persons should be treated for delusions of grandeur or worse. Such a person should not be trusted when such serious issues of life are being dealt with. However, without attempting to be, attempting to give what might be called some final answer to a question, I will try to offer some insights, some possible answers that I hope will be at least a bit helpful to those of us who struggle with these questions. The path to certainty. How can we achieve not only some kind of answer, but with some kind of certainty? And I think the best answer that may be available to us comes in those two verses that, uh, uh, that Mike read to us a little bit ago. For there Paul says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices in the context of worship. Paul is saying, I want you to bring everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you think, everything that you want, everything that you've done, everything that you believe I want you to do. I want you to bring all of those to the altar. And he said, a living sacrifice. Do you understand what he's saying? They only understood a sacrifice as some animal that was killed and laid on the altar. And he didn't say, I want you to kill yourself and, and lay yourself on the altar. I want you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Maybe even envisioning the times when those animals were placed, when animals rather were placed on, uh, on an altar. And as I understand it, they were lashed down by some kind of lash or rope or whatever, using the horns of the altar as part of the means of tying those animals down to the altar. And I think maybe that might be the picture that Paul has in mind. Present your whole self as a living sacrifice. But that's not where he stopped. Uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> that is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. And I love the translation by J.B. Phillips, which says, do not let the world press you into its mold, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That perhaps is the best path that we'll find described anywhere in Scripture as to where, how we might get to some understanding, some uh, certain understanding of what God's will is for us. What do you think of when you think of testing something to approve it? Um, you probably could take that illustrate, take an illustration from many different areas of life. But if you want to test something for its strength and durability, you just put everything you've got into it to see if it stands up to what you believe it should be. And that's what I understand him saying here. Test God's will with a renewed mind and a determined spirit in a worship sense. Colossians 3.10 also adds to this, I think, where it says, do not lie to each other. And uh, that, of course, would easily be understood. But I would add to the scripture, if you'll allow me to do that, do not lie to each other or yourself, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. The path to certainty. That's some clues, I believe, to the path to certainty. But uh, as one writer said, his name is Gene Robinson, I don't know him, but I like what he said. He said, uh, uh, discerning the will of God is a very tricky thing, partly because, you know, the little voice in my head can either be God's voice or it can be my own ego doing a magnificent impression of God's voice. Good statement. What is important? What is important enough that we need to somehow seek God's will in whatever decision making might be involved with it? Uh, God's word, and, and I won't cite a bunch of scriptures, but I think you can easily identify <clears throat> what I'm about to say. The scriptures in many ways seem to indicate that God is concerned about his will being applied in our lives in all things, whether it's giving of thanks or the seeking of understanding of what God's will might be. <clears throat> but when it comes to the important uh, questions, decisions. When are we to use just the everyday common sense that we have? I want to look at that a little bit more later. But listen to the words of John Piper, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. Many things are not specifically addressed in Scripture. We understand that. And we need to find a way to apply biblical truth to new situations. Now I'm quoting him. The Bible does not tell you which person to marry 
or which car to drive, or whether to own a home, where you take your vacation, what cell phone plan to buy, or which brand of orange juice to drink, or a thousand other choices you make. That doesn't mean that God can't have a role in those decisions. God might at some point say, I want you to drink this brand of orange juice because it's going to contact you with this person that I want you to, I want you to know. But there are a thousand or maybe tens of thousands of, of little things in life that our common sense and our, our sense of values and, and our understanding of, of God's overarching concerns about our lives that we don't get specific answers to those, nor do we need them. And perhaps, perhaps it's possible to so, and I'm quoting somebody, over-spiritualize all of those decisions and, and somehow detract from the basic commitment to the will of God. But that brings me to a, another question. What help has God given us in, in this matter of seeking his will. And, and I am indebted to Weatherhead for the five basic things that I want to look at. And, uh, and yet I'm not, uh, I'm not just simply handing you his comments. Um, we can always hope and, and wait for the still small voice that, that comes to us to guide us in doing God's will. And sometimes that does come. And sometimes there is in our understanding a, a very clear word that impacts itself on our mind and heart and we respond because we have firm belief that God's will is being revealed to us. But that may not come as often as we might like. So what kind of built-in help do we have on a daily basis, hour to hour, to help us in this matter? And one of them is conscience. One of the things, and it's not unusual perhaps for us to hear of some kind of event, some kind of action, some kind of reaction, and be able to say immediately, that's wrong. Or to be able to say immediately, that's right. Because our conscience has prepared us for such as that. Uh, sometimes society's norms will cause us to think astray or to maybe go astray. Sometimes society gives us the wrong message about something that is right or wrong. <coughs> and sometimes our own conscience can be desensitized. If we put our conscience down, if we push it away or push, push what it's saying away enough times, it may not speak to us very clearly or might come as Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 2, that it has been seared as with a hot iron. Nobody, I think, wants a seared conscience but it can happen. William Chaney had this to say about conscience. He says, conscience, the sense of right, 
the power of perceiving moral distinctions, the power of discerning between justice and injustice, excellence and baseness, is the highest faculty given, to, given us by God, the whole foundation of our responsibility. And that says something about the magnitude of, of conscience in being an operational factor in our lives. God gave us that. How it is, how it, it is conditioned, how it is sensitized, how it is desensitized may affect how it works in our life. But it's there. It's part of the machinery God has given us. I've already mentioned common sense. <coughs> Weatherhead says, if God has placed the machinery for making a judgment within the mind of man, why should he not use it? Surely insight based on thoughtful appreciation of the situation is more reliable than impulse. I suspect that common sense is operational in every one of your lives. Your common sense might come down a little differently than mine or than somebody else's, but it's there and it's, it's a precious tool and, and when we use it to the very best of our ability to understand, it becomes a part of that decision making that this is the will of God for me just now, at this time, in this place, and for this condition. And we don't have to ask God for a voice in the night or for a special revelation on a billboard on the highway. But there's more. A third thing is the wisdom that comes from others. And the advice of a friend, a friend who knows you, a friend who has reason to trust you and, and whom you have reason to trust, a friend like that can be a precious in, can be a precious aid and give insights uh, that can be a blessing and of great value in discerning what God's will is. Weatherhead says, "Get a friend with Christian insight to lend you his mind in your problem." and God will direct you. And then someone else has said, listening to others takes on greater importance when we're trying to hear the voice of God speaking through them. Do you listen for the voice of God speaking through someone you have learned to trust and whose words you have learned to appreciate and respect. Then there's reading, reading what others have written. And, and as you know, that can be a, a marvelous source of information and a help in guidance. We have libraries. Uh, we have Amazon. <laughs> If you can't get it anywhere else, try Amazon. Uh, we have the internet. We have available a wealth of information, but not all of it is true, and not all of it is helpful. And I think you probably know that maybe better than I do, but when we are looking at another person's writings. I've indicated that while I appreciate the work of Leslie Weatherhead 
he has some theological ideas that I don't agree with, but I don't throw out the book because of that, because I think it has value. That kind of thing, that kind of discernment applies in every area, whether it's reading a book, reading a magazine, uh, reading uh, a historical document, or, or being on uh, social media on the internet, whether, whether it's Facebook or something else. If you do not know how to be discerning and how to sort out truth from fiction, particularly in the days of the internet, you perhaps need to lay off of that source of information if you have not come to a point of being able to make that discernment. There's also listening to the voice of the church. The message in Matthew 18, that when there was a problem, uh, talk to someone, take it uh, eventually, it says, uh, tell it to the church. And in that context, that, that scripture is telling us that in the, in the event of a dispute or when there is a need to administer discipline, this procedure was to be followed. But beyond that, in the collective understanding of a congregation, in the collective faith of a congregation, in the collect collective knowledge of a congregation, there is wisdom. And sometimes we simply need to sit down with one or two or a half dozen of our fellow believers, our congregation, and say, this is an issue I need help with. And you will probably find it. There is what the Quaker Christians call our own inner light. That may not be unlike what I've already been talking about, but the Quaker Christians make a lot of use of quiet time and of listening to hear the voice of God speaking. There is great value in that. We probably miss the boat sometimes when we do not make better use of those tools of, of simply being able to listen, to make sure there's a quiet time in our life either collectively or otherwise, where we listen for God's voice. Weatherhead cautions, though, that in this there is, there is a reason to, be, caught, to uh, be cautious. He said it can be fraught with danger, yet if this, if what comes, I'm sorry, Yet, if the method is used with wisdom and caution, and if what comes in the quiet time is tested by some other ways, no one who knows the facts would deny that God's will is often discerned in this way. And then the the last area that I want to explore for a minute. What do we do? What are we to do when God says no? <coughs> How can I resolve God's will and my disappointment? How can I make peace with the situation in which I have sought God's will, and I have trusted that I had found God's will, and I, <clears throat> I prayed for the 
for that the will of God to to be active in a certain way and it did not happen how do I reconcile the will of God and my own disappointment well that probably is a lifetime task when I have tried to discern God's will and have prayed for divine wisdom and the action uh, and wisdom and action and the answer is no what should I believe what should I feel what should I do There are two quotes that I want to leave with you. A.J. Winters said, one phrase that got me through many difficult times in my life was, <coughs> God's delays are not God's denials. Sometimes the answer no is more like the answer wait. But then another person said, I often tell people that when we get a big no, it is because God has for us a bigger yes. We must do all we can and then trust that his will be done. I like the little quip that somebody shared. They said that they had prayed to God and ask God, why have you so often taken me through troubled waters? And they said, God answered back, because your enemies can't swim. Think about it. And there's a couple final questions. Do I really want God's will? Am I willing to trust that everything that God wants for me is going to be okay with me? And if I have found God's will, do I have the courage to do it? One last word. The will, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God will not protect you. The will of God will never take you where the grace of God will not protect you. Let's pray. Father, you know us, you know our our failings, you know our efforts, and we just pray that you would forgive us for those failures, all of them and each of them, and help us to find your grace to be able to, to discern your will more clearly, and then to attempt to do your will more faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, The Savior is Waiting, and the number is 435. 435. I hope you will allow what we've tried to share today to kind of filter down into your heart and soul as we stand and sing.
May God grant us a, a sense of passion about seeking the will of God and then the strength and courage to do it. Let's pray. Father, we look back over our lives and know that there have been many times that we misread your will or we chose not to do it. And give us, we pray, your forgiveness and help us to be uh, more tuned to your will and more accepting of your grace and guidance. In Christ's name we pray, amen.